All right, this is your last uh, genetics lecture. It's uh, lecture 19. We're a little out of order, but that's okay. And this lecture is going to consist of four video files. Um, item five, um, I've actually uh, just included a YouTube link that I'd like you to have a look at to cover that because you already addressed it through um, conducting your Mastering Genetics homework. So in this first portion, we're going to talk about the various ways that mutations can be categorized. If we're going to talk about mutations, then we need to talk about what they are. So let's define a mutation as any or, or an alteration in a DNA sequence that persists through cell division, i.e. it is not repaired. This could, could include any base pair change, it could include a deletion or an insertion of one or more bases, um, or it could include a major alteration in the structure of a chromosome, for example the loss of a section of a chromosome, or the exchange of you know two major sections within a chromosome as discussed earlier in the class. All of those would constitute mutations if they persisted through cell division and were not repaired. There are a lot of ways to categorize mutations. This can be a somewhat confusing topic. Here we're going to talk about categorizing mutations and their effects by talking about spontaneous versus induced mutations talking about the location that a mutation occurs in, the type of molecular change that occurs, and, and or the phenotypic effect of the mutation. There is a lot of overlap between the four categories listed here. So in other words, you can discuss or describe the same mutation in multiple ways. Spontaneous mutations are mutations for which there is no evident cause. They are the result of normal biological or chemical processes, such as error occurring during routine DNA replication. This is different from the category known as induced mutations. In the case of mut induced mutations, there is a known or suspected cause of the mutation. It's due to some sort of external or extraneous factor, for example, exposure to a mutagenic chemical or to ultraviolet light, or radiation, or some other known mutagenic agent. The term mutation rate refers to the likelihood that a gene undergoes mutation in a single generation or in the formation of single gametes. In the case of spontaneous mutations, this, the mutation rate is very low, whereas in induced mutations, the mutation rate is higher than that seen for spontaneous mutation events. One thing worth noting at this point is that if you look across any organism's genome, there will be um, actually differences in the rate of spontaneous mutation that occur at different locations in the genome. Some seem to be somewhat susceptible to mutation, some less so, whether it is for spontaneous mutation or induced mutations, that it's not uniform across the genome. Mutations can occur in either somatic cells or germ cells. Somatic mutations occur in non-germline tissues and they cannot be inherited. They're non-heritable mutations. That doesn't mean that they're not important to the organism, however. They're very important and in fact it is somatic mutations that often give rise to cancer events. So for example, um, a tumor occurring somewhere in your body um, would be something that is due typically to a somatic mutation, not a mutation that you inherited. Germline mutations, in contrast, are mutations that affect the egg or the sperm, and therefore they're inherited or transmitted to your offsprings. Um, they can also play a role in cancers. For example, certain families that are susceptible to particular forms of cancer, it's often because they're inheriting particular mutations um, in specific tumor suppressor or other relevant genes. Another way to categorize mutations is to talk about the type of molecular change that occurred. And this figure shows um, some different possibilities there in depicting point mutations. Point mutations are shown over on the left. A point mutation could be when you have a base or nucleotide substitution. For example, you went from having an adenine to having a thymine or a guanine at a particular location within a gene or other relevant sequence. You could also have 
deletion mutations. Deletion mutations, if they're just the loss of one or more nucleotides, would also be considered point mutations. So for example, if you lose one cytosine, as shown in the sentence shown here, or one C, it's a letter in this particular example, that can have a pretty serious implication, this type of point mutation, because it results in a frame shift mutation. Similarly, an insertion mutation, where you add a nucleotide, will result in a frame shift mutation. So both deletions or insertions, which are generically referred to as indels, result in frame shifts unless they occur um, three nucleotides at a time, in which case you won't alter the reading frame for a particular coding sequence. Other terms that um, sort of fall into play here are the terms missense mutation. In a missense mutation, you have an altered codon. Um, and therefore you will usually but not always have a different amino acid. Actually, sorry, in let, me, let me say that again. A in, in a missense mutation, you only use that term when you actually do have a different amino acid. A nonsense uh, mutation means that you've changed a codon that is normally for an amino acid into a stop codon, or TER. A silent mutation is when you have a codon change but the amino acid is the same. So you go from one codon for arginine to another codon for arginine. So you don't see any impact at the protein level, just at the DNA sequence level. A transition mutation means that you're swapping a purine for a purine, or a pyrimidine for a pyrimidine. So purines are the adenines and guanines, so maybe you had an adenine at one position and you swap in a guanine instead. That would be a transition mutation. That's different from a transversion mutation where you swap a purine for a pyrimidine or a pyrimidine for a, for a purine. And that's, uh, just notice that that's spelled wrong. It should be purine. All right, let's consider the phenotypic effects of mutation and how to use some of the terms that um, are useful in describing mutations from this context. So if you're a mutation that causes not tyrosine, but tyrosinase, an enzyme that we've discussed previously in class in a few contexts, but also including in which is the formation or its role in um, albino individuals, like this little monkey here. So let's say you have a mutation that causes tyrosinase to be less functional. When an individual has two copies of that mutant gene, let's say that they are albino. What are some terms that you can use to describe this? So if it's a mutation in tyrosinase, that's an enzyme. It's an enzyme that's responsible for the synthesis of melanin. That's a biochemical pathway. So I would say that you've got a biochemical mutation. I would also say that you've got a visible mutation and that it is phenotypically visible when you have it. It's a recessive mutation because you need two copies in order to have an albino individual. And I would also say that this is a loss of function mutation, because as you know from free previous discussions in class, um, that's uh, that this mutant form, the mutant form of the gene that's associated with albinism has no functional gene product. So it's in fact actually null, a null mutation because it's not just that the gene product is less functional, it's that it's not functional at all. So rather than three terms, there are actually four terms, no, five terms that describe this pretty effectively. Right, let's consider the example of what is called P53 protein. So in this example, let's look on the left, WTP53, shown over here. Okay, here's the protein means wild type P53. And wild type P53 protein, when produced in our cells, and this is a human protein, has a half-life of between 6 and 20 minutes. So that's pretty short. That means it's produced, and it's used, and then it pretty rapidly degrades. So it's produced constitutively, but it's controlled at the level of the protein and that we don't keep it around for, for very long. When it's present, what it does is it binds to a consensus sequence within DNA, and when it binds there, it affects the transcription of a set of genes that play a role in controlling apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, mediating growth arrest, 
and senescence. So in other words, it keeps cells from continuing to grow and grow and grow and grow in an unregulated way. It's really important in regulating the control of cell growth. And it's turned on, the, the expression of these genes mediated by p53 is turned on as a result of DNA damage. Now there are lots of mutants that can, uh, mutant forms of p53, but one that's been pretty well characterized is the one shown here, and it results, the mutation in the p53 gene that generates this mutant over here on the right, results in a protein that has a really long half-life, 1 to 24 hours, that's considerably longer than the wild-type form. And it's folded differently, which is why it lasts longer in the cells, and it does not bind to the p53 consensus sequence. So because it doesn't bind to the p53 consensus sequence, it doesn't contribute to turning on the transcription of a number of genes that play a role in controlling cell um, lifespan and, and cell growth or duplication. And so what you see when you have this mutant form of p53 is you have reduced apoptosis, which means reduced program cell death, reduced ability to arrest cell growth, and reduced senescence. So in other words, what we see is uncontrolled cell growth. We also see increased chemoresistance. So these cells are somewhat altered in that they, they can resist killing by other chemical methods. This mutant form of p53 is associated with a lot of different cancers in the body. So what kind of mutation would this be? Let's think of um, a couple of terms. And the terms that I would think of here is, one, it's a regulatory mutation. Okay. Regulatory because P, it, it, it affects a gene that regulates the expression of other genes. And I would also call it, um, I would probably call this a biochemical mutation. Although that might be a little arguable. And then from the point of view of these processes, it's a loss of function. But from the point of these, or this property, it's a gain of function. So it depends on, you have to be kind of specific in how you explain um, this mutant, how you use terms, but that th th those are ways that you can use these terms as they apply to the phenotypic effects of mutation in the context of the p53 gene and protein. All right, let's think about um, the example that I'm indicating here. So in this example, I've got somebody with their hand on their tummy that's been drinking a glass of milk, and um, I want you to imagine that that actually very nice looking tummy is somewhat bloated with gas as the result of lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance is the inability to break this bond at a human level. So this uh, sugar shown here, this disaccharide sugar, is lactose. Okay, and lactose is held together by um, a beta glycosidic linkage, and it's shown here. The enzyme lactase is that most humans or many humans make in the small intestine uh, is able to break that bond, producing galactose and glucose, which can be taken up into the small intestine and metabolized for energy. If you're lactose intolerant, then the genes that you have encoding lactase, one or more of them, are no good, and they don't produce functional gene product. And so as a result, you yourself cannot break down your lactose, so the bacteria in your large intestine will do it, and that produces gas and discomfort. So this is kind of the classic example of a biochemical mutation. And I would say that it is also a loss of function mutation. So this is a mutant Drosophila melanogaster in that it has a yellow body color. So this uh, fly is mutated at one or more of the genes that are responsible for producing and depositing pigment into the body area of this fly which in a wild type is grayish brown. So um, although this is um, a visible mutation in, with regards to body color, and it's also a biochemical mutation because it's, um, there are mutations 
or mutant forms of genes responsible for biochemical pathways. An interesting thing about these flies, these particular mutant flies, is that they don't mate as frequently as wild type, which you wouldn't know just to look at them, that, that the color change would also affect their mating frequency. So another way that we can classify the mutations that are impacting these flies is to call them behavioral mutations because the mutant genes present are affecting their um, normal organismal behavior. All right, so do you remember learning about the agouti gene earlier in class? And we used that uh, earlier in class as an example of um, a gene that was associated with coloring in mice and also other effects such as weight. Um, and if you are in a form of mouse that inherits um, both mutant alleles, as shown by AY, AY here, then those mice are actually never observed because the agouti mutation, or this particular mutation at the agouti gene, is a lethal mutation. So a lethal mutation is one that, that results in non-viable progeny or non-viable organisms. In this case, we never see mice that are AYAY because they die at the embryonic stage. So any yellow mice that we see, which are showing the so-called agouti phenotype, we know that they have to be AYA. They have to be heterozygous for the um, agouti gene so that they have at least one wild type allele rescuing them from lethality. All right, let's use some of these terms that we've learned. Let's think about a mutation in tyrosinase, either human or um, other non-human animals. As shown here on the left, we have a Siamese cat. And Siamese cats have these very characteristic blue eyes um, associated with that breed. And that in Siamese cats is a result of having a, a mutant form of tyrosinase where there is a single amino acid change. At the 402nd amino acid, an arginine has been changed to glutamine. And that results in um, a particular eye color seen in Siamese cats. And this same mutation can occur in humans. And in humans, it manifests itself as a condition that is called oculocutaneous type 1 albinism. And this baby has this condition here. And if you look at the baby's eye color, um, it's a little unusual. The baby's also quite fair, showing other aspects of albinism. This isn't full-fledged albinism. It's just one type of albinism that affects um, pigmentation primarily um, in the eyes. And so I would say that because we know a little bit about the sequence change, we know that a missense mutation has occurred, which isn't describing the mutation as phenotypic. That's really focusing on the, um, the nature at the protein level of the mutation. But we also know that it res has resulted in altered eye color. And so it's a visible mutation. We don't have complete eye coloring, so it's also a loss of function mutation. Okay, and that concludes our discussion of how to categorize uh, mutations, and I'd like you to proceed to part two of this lecture next.